And then look at verse 11. <clears throat> and this is a doctrine that churches don't teach you and they don't believe. Right. And white robes were given unto every one of them. Notice these were given to who? The souls at verse 9. Right. So notice that a soul can wear a robe. Amen. You know what that means? A soul has a bodily shape. Amen. Oh, I don't believe in that. Where'd you learn that from? Scripture. Scripture. Let's look at Luke chapter 16. Luke 16. Oh, I don't believe in that. Are you kidding me? Look at this soul right here. Luke chapter 16. Soul has bodily shape. Look at Luke chapter 16. We'll read verse 23. Notice right here that a damned soul and a saved soul, that they have bodily shapes, bodily functions. Luke chapter 16, verse 23. And in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torments, and notice right here, see it. So notice it said eyes, right, at verse 23? So same thing like a body does. Afar off and Lazarus in his what? Bosom. Well, that's a body part right here. Notice in verse 24, and he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his what? Finger, Finger see, in water and cool my what? Tongue. Okay, that should be more than enough to convince you that a soul has a bodily shape and function. Now show that to your pastor and maybe he might throw a fit after that. He may not believe that. But a soul has a bodily shape, bodily figure, bodily functions. That's why verse 11, they were given white robes. Now keep your hand on Luke 16 and go back to Revelation 6. I'm going to show you something here. Another interesting teaching at verse 9. Verse 9, you saw the human sacrifices, but here's something that's interesting. These souls were already dead. The souls of them, so they're already a soul. Okay, if you're killed and you become this soul, where does this soul go? Notice it's not above the altar up in heaven. It says the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the, uh, excuse me, uh, where am I? I saw under the altar, verse 9. I saw under the altar the souls of them, right? Is that what verse 9 shows? Now, you notice when I drew these souls, I didn't draw it up in heaven. They were under the altar. They're below. Wait a minute. When did you ever read in your Bible where a saved soul would be underneath the earth? Look back at Luke 16. Luke 16. Hell is where? The Bible, Jesus said hell is at the heart of the earth, right? Look at verse 23. And in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torments. But look who's at that location where hell is. It's not just a lost soul. And seeth Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. These are saved souls. Are they frying in hell though? Well, look at verse 25. But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. And beside all this, look at this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed. So look at, they're at the same location where hell is, but there is a gulf between them. One side is a place of comfort. The other side is a place of torment. Did you remember my teaching on Revelation 1 about Jesus Christ when he took the keys from hell and of death and went below? The Bible says where Jesus looked at the thief on the cross and he said this, Today, today, when he died, today, thou shalt be with me in where? Paradise. Did he go to heaven first or to hell first? The Bible says Jesus went to the lower parts of the earth first and then ascended above. Wait, then you're saying then if Jesus went to paradise that same day but went below, that means there is a paradise below? Yes, you're using your heads now, all right? All right, just connect verses. Just connect scripture with scripture. So there was a paradise below the earth and if you look at Luke 16, that makes sense. There was. Abraham and Lazarus on one side, and then there's a gulf, and then the other side, 
which I drew this little friend right here, is hell, right? right? So there's hell, and then that gulf, and right here is paradise right here. Absolutely. Wow! That, then you're saying then, when did souls, saved souls, ever been below the earth? You're going to find that out, Luke 16. You're going to compare it with Jesus where he said, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. Yeah. And then you look at Romans and Ephesians where it says that he went first, descended to the lower parts of the earth. They actually said that first and then after that he went up yeah. to heaven. Yeah. See? So notice right here then, you're saying that paradise is going to open again, Pastor. Yeah. Absolutely right. Yeah. It's going to open up again. That doesn't make sense. No, it makes sense if you believe in a doctrine called dispensationalism. Okay, now think about this. We Christians, after we die, we go to paradise, which is above, immediately up to heaven, right? But in the Old Testament, Luke 16, we realize they didn't go up to heaven immediately. That they were below the earth. And in the tribulation, they do that again. Why is it the Old Testament... And the tribulation is similar here. I wonder why. Because if you believe in a doctrine called dispensationalism, what did the Bible say? God's nation during the Old Testament was not the Christian church. It was Israel. He's dealing with the Christian church right now. But when it comes to the tribulation, where's the Christian church? They're already raptured. Who's he returning again to the nation? Israel. Romans chapter 11, God temporarily put them aside, but he said at the future tribulation when I come, I'm going to restore you. So he's returning back to Israel. That's why it makes sense following the, Jew, the Jewish system that he did at the Old Testament, he's repeating something again. That's the same thing. But to go to paradise, heaven or hell, it depends upon your salvation too, right? then that shows right here, if this paradise, this attainment of salvation at the end is different, that means in the tribulation, <gasps> salvation is different too. No. Yes. Yeah, nod your head. Don't be in shock. Don't wet your pants, okay? <laughs> nod your head, okay? I know you're independent fundamental Baptist, and this is heresy to you, but this is not heresy. This is scripture. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Scripture shows there's a different salvation. Yes, That's why it would make so much sense. I mean... What are you going to do with Revelation 14? Revelation 14 says you, uh, you must ignore, you must reject the mark of the beast. If you don't reject that, then you burn in hell forever. And then it follows after that by rejecting the mark of the beast. If we're going to use common sense, isn't that a work? Yeah. Yes, that's a work. If you don't think that's a work, then for crying out loud... How many people are denying Jesus Christ today in a comfortable Laodicean apostasy and then when you're interrogated by an officer and they say deny the name of Jesus, if you deny the name of Jesus today, are you going to burn in hell? No, you're eternally secure. But during that time, you're not just going to get some kind of persecution like today. You're going to get hell on earth from the Antichrist where those people are looking at you with forks and knives ready to eat you where they're about to flay you. Yeah. And then you got the Antichrist with, with that demonic eyes, and then hell and all these guys unleashed looking at you, yeah. and then you're going to be what? Stand up, stand up. No, I'll tell you what you're going to do. You're going to go like this, man. You're going to go like this, man. And then what's going to happen? You have to resist denying Jesus Christ that time. That's a lot of work. You have to endure the persecution of Satan's hell on earth, that torture, that persecution. You have to endure through that. And you don't call that a work? That's a work, man. That's a work. And if you deny it, Revelation 14 says, you must reject the mark of the beast because here, here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. So following that verse about rejecting the mark of the beast, it said here is. It's defining you what rejecting the mark of the beast is. It's faith and works. Yeah. All right, you can't deny that. Now, either you can go by Baptist tradition or you can go by Scripture, which produced the Baptist churches later on. Okay, now let's go back to uh, Luke. Uh, no, we already read Luke. Let's go back to Revelation 6. Revelation 6. Can I tell you something else that's interesting, if that's not enough? 
Did you ever look up the word paradise in your English dictionary? <laughs> paradise, everyone thinks that has to be a third heaven, but paradise, if you look up at an inter, uh, in an English dictionary, there's another definition. It's an intermediate state where souls are held. Look it up. Look up at the dictionary. I saw it at Merriam-Webster. It mentioned about an intermediate place where souls are waiting. Wait, that matches with Old Testament where the souls, they were waiting for their Redeemer. Right. Not only that, Revelation 6, didn't God said they're supposed to wait at verse 11? And white robes were given unto every one of them, and it was said unto them, God was telling those souls under the altar that they should rest yet for a little season. See, they're waiting. They're waiting for their Redeemer. They're waiting for their Redeemer. That's why it makes so much sense about the first coming and second coming. Both Jews were waiting for their Redeemer. Yes. See how scriptures just go bang, bang, bang together when you start teaching this dispensationalism stuff? Man. It starts to click now everything else. Thank you, Lord. How about that? When Jesus came down the first time, he came as a Redeemer and gave us spiritual salvation. Praise the Lord. When he comes down the second time, he's giving salvation to all the earth. That's a physical, and he restores creation. See? It's first coming, second coming. He comes down as redeemer. All right, let's look at Revelation chapter 6. So they're given white robes, right, at verse 11. Do you recall Revelation chapter 2 and 3, where they were given white robes uh, to the church of Philadelphia, Ephesus, etc.? This is why... We're not weak dispensationalists. We're Bible-believing dispensationalists. We believe Revelation 2 and 3 does not completely apply to the Christian church. We believe it's a double application. We see an application to the Christian church, but there's a doctrinal application to the tribulation. So then these white robes, when God's talking about endure, right? At Revelation 2 and 3, talks about enduring their works. Why? Because... They're going to resist the Antichrist system at 9, 10, and 11. <coughs> so God's going to bless them with right, white robes if they endure. So notice that this fulfills Revelation 2 and 3 right here. It was said unto them that, uh, that they should rest yet for a little season until their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. Wow. So that's not enough. There are more people has to die. More people has to die. Don't tell me it's not going to be crazy. Notice it says should be what? Fulfilled. That's ordained by scripture then. Wow, yeah, that's, that's a scriptural fulfillment yeah, right there. Why? Because Jesus prophesied about scripture being fulfilled where there's going to be persecution. Run for your life. And you're crazy enough and you're half insane saying that you want to go through the tribulation, huh? Okay, let's look at verse 12. So notice how scary this is going to be. Notice it says, And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal. So now we come to the sixth seal. And I'm going to close it off right here. So we only covered one seal today, actually. That's surprising. So, yeah, there was a lot. No wonder this is just the beginning of sorrows, right? <laughs> All right, at the sixth seal, this is the utmost nightmare. But this utmost nightmare will apply to a lost person. So if you're a lost person, this is the utmost nightmare above all the five that, you, that they're going through. So look at the sixth one. And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake. So a huge earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair. So the sun is going to turn dark. And the moon became as blood. You're going to see red moon there. And the stars of heaven fell unto the earth. So all the stars that you see outside, all of a sudden it's going to fall down. Even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind. In other words, that fig tree is losing its own leaves and figs as if a mighty wind passed through it, right? And then you see that fig tree just all of a sudden things falling down, falling down, so many things falling down, like a wind blowing it, like that. 
So th that's what you're going to see the stars of heaven doing the same thing as if it's a fig tree and all of a sudden you see like that falling all over around you. So this is the utmost nightmare where everything, the whole universe, just turns into a cataclysmic event. The earth shakes and you literally believe this is the end of the world. That's going to be the most scary part where there's no place to hide. Verse 14, notice, and the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together. See that? So the heaven, when you're looking up at the galaxy and the sky over there, it's just going to roll up like a scroll. And every mountain and island were moved out of their places. Go to any island you think that you can hide? Go to any high mountaintop you think you're going to run away? No, they're going to all move out of place. This is scary. And the kings of the earth and the great men and the rich men and the chief captains and the mighty men now, notice all these rich, 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 rich people, right? Remember that 1% elite from the famine? They thought they were sheltered. And then some of those uh, Jews, they thought that they can compromise with the elites. And that's why some Jews joined the elite system. They make that covenant with the Antichrist and death and hell, thinking, I can get away with it. But no, look at these rich people. They, they can't run away. They think that they're the ones that are going to survive the apocalypse. And all the people wipe out? No, God's, God got their number. Yeah. But it's not just rich people. You'll notice, sadly, even the common people and every bondman and every free man. See, God judges the whole earth. Yeah. Hid themselves in the dens and the rocks of the mountains. Why? Because they heard that Alex Jones stuff where, hey, if you're going to survive, then you've got to find your little hideout over here. And then the elites, they already have their bunker set up. But then what's going to happen is when they all hide in their safe zone, you know, what, you know what they're going to do? Verse 16, and said to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. So notice that these elites and everybody, they go to their hiding places. The rich people hide in their safety, safe spaces, so to speak. And then when the mountains and islands are moved out of places, all they could hope for is that when those mountains are moving out of place, that those rocks would just crash on them. Why? Because that's how dreadful yeah. God is. Yeah. The Bible says heaven and earth fled away from the face of him. Yeah. If you think this is bad, I'll tell you what's the worst thing that will, that will ever happen to you is that if you're an unbeliever, you see God face to face, and that will terrify you more than anything else on earth. That will be the scariest thing. Notice it says at the last part of verse 16, and from the wrath of the Lamb, for the great day of his wrath is come. See? Mm -hmm. That's God's wrath, Jesus' wrath. Who shall be able to stand? No one can stand it. So there is an event, notice right here, called the day of wrath. And we come right here to the sixth seal. Day of wrath. Of wrath. That is God's second coming when he comes down. Because notice it says, hide us from the face of him, right? Hide us from him. So he's coming down. That's undoubtedly his second coming. Right. When he comes down, it's going to be a scary thing. Now let me ask you this one question. If you say Christians think that the judgment seat of Christ is going to be a walk in the park, you got to realize this, is that how, how can these people be that much afraid of his face and then you think that the judgment seat of Christ, oh, I can sit and do whatever I want when you see him face to face in the glorified holy body of Jesus Christ. And when God reveals your works to you, you really think that this is going to be a walk in the park. Sobering thought.